everyone. My name is Patrick Sullivan. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist, and I'm pleased to be with you today for this Smart Catholic Conference, uh, well, called Immortal Combat. Today's topic together is actually an important one, and I'm so pleased to be able to be the person to speak to you about this, and that's the topic of priest, wimp, or warrior. Before we can dive in, though, we need to kind of back up a bit and make sure we all have the same well, premise, the same baseline that we can jump off from, and it's this. In the ancient world, there was this very important concept called anamnesis. Now, leave the, the fancy pronunciation aside for a moment. Anamnesis is basically bringing the past to the present. It's a memory made real. It's entering sacred memory. So when I just don't remember Passover, I recall it, and because I recall it, I'm living it. I don't just recall the Last Supper with Jesus, I go to Mass every time and I'm there in that one sacrifice that affects all of eternity. That's an amnesis. It's powerful, it's real, and that's why we need to start there. But how does that relate to our topic? Well, I think today many of us are forgetting a very important lived memory, something we need to remember and live. And what is that? That the origin of the priest is not just someone who can organize events. The origin of the priest is not just someone who has a very good listening ear and can counsel. No, the origin of the priest, again, remember this word, anamnesis, remember, recall, to live. The origin of the priest is that of a warrior. And I, to recover that, this is the odd thing to me, I get kind of excited about this, because to recover that very often in the spiritual life, we need to actually go to God's enemies, the spirit of the world. We need to go to that spirit that says the, the priest is not important. We need to go to that spirit that says the church is not important. We need to go to the enemy of the church and say, what do you remember of the priest? And I find this so fascinating. When you look at the culture today, really the anti-culture, what do you find? Well, leaving the accusations aside, you actually see in the movies, in the video games, this image of priest that is actually quite powerful and unique. Think about it. Go to the, that game Dungeons and Dragons and you see when they put this band together to fight villages and monsters and everything else, what are your options? Well, you can have a warrior. You can have someone who's a thief, uh, someone who is very cunning and can convince others to do what they want. But in that band of brigands, who do they have? They have the option of the mage or the priest. Why? Well, because the, the deep mind of the anti-culture remembers a time when, really, when it came down to it, when there was a supernatural battle, you wanted the priest with you to fight that battle with you. And you know this. When they are going to a village and they need to slay this spirit, there's something in there menacing, you don't get the sharpshooter. You don't get the gunslinger. You don't get the great swordsman. Who do you get? You pull out the priest, and he brings tools to the battle, weapons to the battle, and enables your team to move on. Now, that is so hugely important, but it's there. It's out there in the mind of the culture, that anti-culture, and they put it out on display very often. What about another one? Go to some of the movies of late. Maybe it's a couple years old now, but I remember one called, literally, Priest. And it was this kind of supernatural figure himself, but he was indeed a Catholic priest, who went out to fight these very demonic-looking vampires. And maybe I'm remembering that wrong. You can tell me in the comments below. But there again, you saw on screen, who do you want fighting this spiritual battle right here and now? It's not going to, again, be the person who's got a cannon or those who have many horses. No, no, it's going to be this figure, this character, this priest. So you see, when we look back into our own deep mind of the church, it's there, but many of us have forgotten when we look out in the anti-culture, though, we can see, hold on, they remember something that we need to basically call back to live again and get deeply right there. All right. I want to just kind of shift gears for a moment and go to a personal story many years ago now. I was an instructor of theology for various educators in the Catholic school system. And I was taking a break. I don't know what I was teaching that day. Maybe it was ethics, maybe it was scripture, but I was taking a break and I was having lunch. And one of the other instructors came in all in a huff, very upset. And one of the other instructors inquired, what, what's wrong? Why, why are you so upset with yourself? And she said, oh, I'm not upset with myself. I'm upset with the people I'm teaching. And when I said, why, what happened? She said, well, they have this crazy notion 
The notion is that the priest is actually allowed, and this is the word you use, the priest is actually allowed to figure out how things are done at Mass. Now, I took it in stride. I was eating my sandwich, I recall, and I just it kind of looked up barely, and I said, well, that makes sense. They'd be upset if others were trying to tell a priest how to deal with the workings of the Mass, because quite frankly, the priest is the guardian of the sacred. And I kind of put my head back down and continued eating my sandwich. Well, this other instructor, this colleague of mine, just lost the plot. For her, this was uh, such a, a grave injustice to modern man and modern woman, and she couldn't fathom how such an educated person such as myself could say such ignorance. Well, here's the thing. She had forgotten, again, like many of us do today, the origins, <coughs> excuse me, the origins of the priesthood. You see, the priests, we do not find their origins in event planning. We do not find their origins in basically being a good listener or counselor. If you want to get back to the beginning, if you want to go back to the origins of the priest and live it and see it and get the effects of it, then you need to go back to a time many millennia ago when the priest was born into the world as warrior. Well, let's look at a few examples. Go back right to the beginning with me to the Garden of Eden. And there, of course, you'll recall that the first man is created, this Adam. Now, what I think most of us have missed in the past, especially with this episode with the creation of humanity, is that this Adam, this man, really, is given a task. And what is that task? Well, he's actually commanded to Abudah and Shamar to guard and cultivate. Now, that should fascinate you. Because this man who's put in the Garden of Eden, this beautiful place, is told to guard. Why? Well, the ancient Jews would say it's because, quite simply, Adam is both a priest and a husband. Adam is meant to give glory to God, to worship to God. In fact, the very first temple they had in the frescoes up above, images of creation, images of the garden, to remind the priest this is where we come from, this is its origins. Well, here is Adam. He's meant to guard. And if you know the story, and I'm certain that you do, his testing of his priesthood comes very quickly with the Nahash, that serpent, sauntering in. Let's go to another one, though. I think one that you recall much more readily and is much more out there in the common memory of the faithful. And that's of the brother of Moses, Aaron. You recall that Aaron is kind of brought along. Moses has this battle. It's a very temporal battle. He has to go back into a land that he comes from. He must go face off with the Pharaoh, the, one of the most mighty men of the, that time period. And he must bold face say, let my people go. Now, those are fighting words. Who does he get, though, to tag along with him? Who does he, again, is it a sharpshooter? Is it a man with uh, his own chariot? Is it someone who can come in slashing and burning. No, it's Aaron, his brother. And Aaron, as you know, will later be called the very first high priest. It's Aaron's staff, you'll recall, that does the, the wonderful dance with the serpents. It's Aaron's staff that'll part the Red Sea. You see, Aaron comes forward as priest to accompany the one who's in the temporal battle. Can you see now that video game? Can you see that movie? There is a supernatural battle about us as well. Okay, where's the priest? We cannot say, well, I just need to take care of temporal things, and that in turn will take care of the spiritual things. That's not how it works. We always take care of the greater or the higher and let it trickle down to the lower. And that's exactly what happened here. With Aaron instead, with Aaron accompanying him, Moses can now do what he's called to do. He can say, let my people go, really, in this time right here now. Because Aaron, with the power that God has given him, can fight that spiritual battle against the magicians of Pharaoh and against the many petty gods that the Egyptians believed and worshipped. And you see, this is what I think most of us are missing today. We say to ourselves, to our neighbors, maybe to our wives, to God certainly, all right, you've given me this task. You've given me this battle. And really, if I'm a man of God, then I'll kind of I'll pull myself together and I'll talk to you, Lord, a lot, I'm sure, but then I need to do it. I need to accomplish it. When what we're forgetting really is that the paradigm, the, the, the thing we're supposed to imitate is this Moses-Aaron experience. When I go into the temporal battle, I must remember the one I need alongside with me is the priest, the holy priest of God. 
I need to remember that as much as I want to fight the temporal, as much as I want to save my family, I want to save my neighbor, I want things to be better for those I love, as much as I want and need that, if I'm to accomplish it, I must go after the higher so that it trickles down to the lower. And how do I do that? I turn to the priest of God in my life. And I say, will you accompany me on this mission, this journey? Because over there in that village, there are spirits that need to be slayed. And over there in that place, there are demons that need to be thrown out. Remember that ekvalin, to cast out, to throw out. All right, let's do, let's do another one. Fast forward, and there's this problem, right? Moses comes down the mountain after having this great theophany experiencing God, Ten Commandments, and as he comes down, he sees the people of God worshiping the golden calf. Well, he drops the tablets or throws them, and they break, and a war is about to happen. Moses calls anyone who's faithful to the true God, anyone who's left, come to my side, let's fight this, again, really temporal battle. And who comes? The Levites. The tribe of Levi come and stand next to Moses, and they turn... <clears throat> They turn and do battle with all those. Remember, now we have emerging, the temporal, yes, fighting temporal, the spiritual, fighting spiritual. They do battle with all those who want to cling to the old gods and cling to this new god of the golden calf. Again, the origins of the priesthood here with the Levites is one of struggle, of battle, of reorienting the people of God back to the God who loves us because only there when we're right-oriented can we actually live out the blessings God has given us every day of our lives? So I want you to think about this. In Adam, we have this origin of the priesthood that's tied to us as husbands and fathers. We're meant to guard. This is in us. This is why many of you men right now, you feel this kind of urge to protect, to reach out and help those you love. We move to Aaron, the one who accompanies Moses. And then, of course, we get to the Levites. And here, their origins is quite simple. It is a battleground. Who do you serve? How will we fight this battle? It's about spiritual realities and temporal realities. And the Levites, they actually come to the call. And from that point forward, we know that the priesthood, which was originally intended for the firstborn, first maleborn in the family, has now passed on to the special class of persons. All right. Well, what does all this mean? Well, it means two things as far as I'm concerned. The first is that priests themselves need to start believing in their power. They need to start believing in their authority. They are much more than event planners and organizers and counselors and even great listeners. Hopefully they are all of those things as well. But at base, at their origin, this sacerdotus, this holy person, at base their origin is one of warrior. And they need to own that, live that, and proclaim that. I'm actually thinking about one book I read many years ago that brought this to the fore beautifully. And uh, I brought it with me just to be able to read it to you. Because here was an example I thought when I read it. I was reading it with my kids many years ago. Of a priest who knows who he is and knows what he's about. And in this particular dialogue, he's trying to convince someone, this woman, not to actually have an abortion. This is the way it goes. I, I found it fascinating. She said this, Therefore, you're asking me to let her die slowly and, and he interrupts. No, I'm not asking you. As a priest of Christ, I'm commanding you by the authority of Almighty God not to lay hands on your child, not to offer her life and sacrifice to a false God of expedient mercy. I do not advise you. I adjure you and command you in the name of Christ, the King. That's the kind of authority that our priests need to recover. That's the kind of self-awareness, the kind of memory, the kind of anamnesis we need to bring before and relive again. That's the first thing. But the second thing is this, and this is what I'm really hoping you'll take away from today's talk, this conversation together. That as you enter into your mission, your vocation, when you are sent on the path that you must trot, when you are sent by our, our God to fight that battle and save those people, save your wife, save your children, save your neighbor. When you are told to Abba and Shamar, when you are told and called as you are to pick up your sword and go face the Pharaoh in your life, I need you to remember, you need to remember that when you enter into that battle, you need your Aaron. 
when you enter into that battle, you need that staff, the weapons that He can give you. When you enter into the battle of your life, I know some of you know of this battle, you know what it's like. I need you to say, anyone who is with God, stand with me, just like Moses did. Because you, you know this, I don't need to convince you of this. You are at a battle right now in your life. It's both temporal and spiritual. Yes, get the best tools that you can to help you fight the temporal battle. But when it comes to the spiritual, get an Aaron at your side. Maybe it's your pastor, maybe it's a priest friend of yours. Get them right there alongside of you and together conquer the enemy. So friends, all of that being said, thank you for joining me for this little conversation today. If I had to sum it up, what would I say? Well, the priest is certainly not a whip. The priest in his very origins is a warrior. But here's the important thing. They're a warrior for you. They're a warrior to be at your side. So grab it from the deep memory of the church. Recognize it when you see it being played out in the anti-culture. And you yourself in your life today, think, which priest can I call to my side to fight that spiritual battle? Because it is that important. Anyway, it's been fun chatting with you. If you want to learn more, reach out to me, comment below. And of course, you can always get a hold of me on my YouTube channel or at evango.net. God bless you. My name is Patrick Sullivan. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist. Let's fight this battle because with the errands of the world, we can win. Have a great day.